One of the biggest annual costs to a ranch is feed. And for ranchers that are profit-minded, it's not the gross numbers that count, it's the net. It's easy to look on uh, the day that we sell our cattle, our fat cattle, and see what we got for them. But many times people aren't calculating what you have in them. Today, Bryson Birgo out of Northwest Missouri and Brian Herbelsheimer out of Northeast Nebraska are my guests as we talk feed efficiency in our cattle herds, how it impacts profitability through feed costs, longevity, and increased production, and one factor that distracts ranchers from truly being committed to a feed-efficient herd on this episode of the Working Ranch Radio Show. Hi everyone, Justin Mills here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Thank you for joining us here on our program today. For those of you tuning in on Rural Radio Channel 147, we appreciate you joining us here on this weekend's edition. By the way, you'll find us right here every Saturday and Sunday at 12 noon Eastern. And for those of you that took the time or had it already downloaded through your podcast platform, we thank you for taking the time to listen to our program. And I know as it comes out, we find folks in uh, across the different times Time zones in a lot of different things. Maybe you're out feeding cattle, you're in the tractor, you're in your feed pickup, or you're out fixing fence, or you're just doing something out on the place. We appreciate you taking the time to listen to our program. By the way, today is episode 57. Well, like I said in our intro today, we're going to be talking on the subject of feed efficiency in our cattle herds. And I know this is a subject I feel that can be adapted to pretty much any operation out there, no matter uh, the area that you're running in, rainfall and how that affects that to the type of cattle that you're running there's going to be things we're going to be talking about that i think can be applied to most any operation out there because we're going to be talking about the direction of of where a herd needs to go from a genetic standpoint why that's important when we also look at some of these feed efficiency studies out there that we're looking at these on an apples to apples basis and then also we're going to be touching a little bit on a topics of, of what is holding our cattle herd back and our in us as a rancher back from maybe moving towards really being committed to a feed efficient herd and it really has nothing to do with the cattle as much as it is maybe our own personal decisions that we choose to make so we're going to be talking about that today with my guest today Brian Birgo of Birgo Angus and Brian Herbelsheimer with Herb Angus. Also coming up in just a few moments, the Captain Tim O'Byrne, publisher and editor of Working Ranch Magazine, will be stopping by with this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. And meteorologist Don Day will join us in our very last segment today with a look at our long-term weather. Right now, a big thank you to the sponsors of the Working Ranch Radio Show, the American Simmental Association, and they believe that one of their primary purposes for existence is genetic genetic evaluation and providing genetic awareness tools that help you the producer make good decisions that can move your operation forward from internal traits to terminal traits the genetic merit of Simmental genetics has provided increased profitability to the rancher sim genetics profit through science find out more at simmental.org other sponsors include the king ranch institute of ranch management we're going to talk about it more in just a few moments about some openings that they have for their master's program in ranch management that's at the king ranch institute of ranch management other sponsors include the american hereford association come home to hereford and the north american limousine foundation limousine cattle deliver to your bottom line well right now it is time to check in with the Captain Tim O'Byrne for this week's edition of Tim's Two Cents. Hey, Justin. Hey, everybody out there in Radio Land. The March issue should be on your coffee table as we speak, unless your brother-in-law took it like he's been known to do. Page 56, Working Ranch Special Report by Casey Atkinson. Uh, she actually wrote two stories for this issue, but this one is Poor Plan or keen concept is President Biden's executive order to get more cash in beef producers' pockets going to work. Page 56. It's all about the whole packing plant thing. She wrote another one, Justin, Wyoming Stock Growers Association profile on page 78. And we got a couple other cool ones here, and I think it's perfect timing for that. Page 30 is uh, colostrum counts, but the calf needs it right away. No, folks, this is not just another colostrum article our 
amazing writer Gilda V. Bryant really, you know, really gives. I mean, there's a there's a lot of good information there, and she makes it short and sweet. Love it. And uh, other stories there, and uh, check it out. March issue, Working Ranch Magazine, and guys, cowboys out there, listen to me very carefully. This is a public service announcement. Valentine's Day is Monday. Monday. You better do something this year, but don't do too much and make the rest of us look bad. Justin, back to you in the booth. All right. Thanks, Captain, and thanks for the heads up on the Valentine's Day. Good good one there. Also, thanks for the heads up on what's coming up in the March issue of Working Ranch Magazine. And folks, you know, I just come back from the cattle convention down in Houston, Texas, and I'll tell you, we had a lot of people going by our booth, and here is the one common phrase that I heard is that you guys have the best magazine the best articles the best pictures of anything out there and i'm just telling you what i heard folks i'm not trying to be biased here maybe i am a little bit but nevertheless that is what i heard so take it from the many passer buyers that we saw down at the cattle convention in houston texas they like it and i think you'll like it too go to workingranchmag.com to get signed up with your subscription if you're not already getting it today well stay with us when we come back we'll get into our main topic today on feed efficiency in our cattle herd we'll be back with more after this. It's a competitive calf market, and buyers want calves that will perform, period. And a proven solution is Simmental. In fact, data from the Tri-County Steer Carcass Fertility from 2002 through 2018 on nearly 60,000 head of calves revealed that Simmental sired calves represented the highest carcass-valued sired group over English and other continental breed groups. And the sire group that was the second highest carcass value was Simangus Sire. So, the proof's right there. For low-risk, high-potential calves with earning potential, be confident that Sim Genetics will give you more per head, period. Stand strong. Simmental. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here, and we're glad to have you tuned in on our program today as we get into our, our main subject today on feed efficiency in our cattle herds. And, and as I said previously, really this is a topic that is uh, pretty much widespread across our industry because at the end of the day uh, you know we really want cattle that can that can convert and it doesn't matter uh, if you're in an area with a lot of uh, uh, high moisture area and you have a lot of forage available to more drier climates uh, but at the end of the day we want cattle that can convert and so today my guest is Bryson Birgo with Birgo Angus out of northwest Missouri Brian Herbelsheimer with Herb Angus out of northeast Nebraska and gentlemen first of all I want to thank you for taking the time out of your schedules to join us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Appreciate you having us, Justin. Well, let's get started here first, and and uh, and and Bryson, I'll I'll go to you first here because uh, when we talk about feed efficiency, and I know it's something that you guys uh, focus a lot in your breeding program, and uh, but I want to talk about from your perspective as as you looked at at the breeding program that you you guys have developed and why uh, this fun this has so much fundamental to the basis of of really the cattle industry across the country. <laughs> Sure. Uh, so we started feed efficiency testing um, almost 30 years ago now. Uh, my dad and grandfather uh, started feed sessions, uh, a test at Northwest Missouri State University. And we kind of dove into it back then thinking, OK, we want to find these cattle that uh, can can utilize their feed resources. But, um, you know, over the years of, of testing and finding all this, probably, probably the greatest benefit we've seen from the feed efficiency end of things is just the the savings in the cow herd and the increased um, productivity of the cow herd. And sometimes, you know, you set out to, to find data on something, um, not not knowing where you'll end mm-hmm. up. And I guess one of the greatest things we've seen with, uh, with the feed efficiency is just the increased longevity of our cow herd. Um, like I say, this was kind of a function indirectly, I think, because mm-hmm. um, it wasn't maybe the goal as we set out. But as we were testing these bulls, finding the bulls that were more efficient, indirectly, um, we found cows that would stay more efficient, flusher in the breeding season, um, breeding back in Kevin on time. And as we all know, you know, that's one of the biggest things, profitability in the cattle industry is that we have a calf every year. Um, and if we can get those cows to stay in the herd longer, um, there's just more money that we can make and utilize just because it costs so much to get the cows into production that if we can sit there and we can get another year, another two years on average out of the cows, um, I think it's huge. And I think we've done that indirectly 
by finding, you know, the feed efficient cows just because they're in better condition. They're Kevin on time and they're lasting longer. Mm -hmm. Uh, Brian, I want to go to you. And from your perspective, you know, kind of that same question. I mean, where this this basis of looking at, you know, turning out a sire that, you know, that is is putting back into these cattle some elements that's getting back to efficient cattle. And I know, you know, you're a cattle feeder yourself, so I know you look at it from that perspective. But but what's your perspective on that? Absolutely. No, it uh, it uh, it hits so many angles. You know, longevity is huge, you know, and and uh, as far as custom feeding cattle for people, uh, we build our customers every month, you know, and and the feed prices continue to go up, you know, um, um, it's costing more to raise feed. So, you know, the, the, end, the end dollar just keeps going up and up and up, you know, so <clears throat> we feel it's important that uh, for ourselves and not only our customers that we uh, try and produce um, more feed efficient animal, you know, um, to pass on. And, uh, you know, it, 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 it puts more money in your pocket, you know, um, whether it's longevity or in the feed yard, you know, it, uh, the more money you can keep a cow, the longer you can keep a cow around, around the more you're going to make, the, the shorter time you can keep that steer in the yard, you know, because he's converting better, um, the more money you're going to make. You know, it's our second year um, feed efficiency testing all of our animals that we sell. Um, and it's, it's been interesting, you know, and, and, and we can definitely see um, different cow families that are, mm-hmm. are doing the job and, and cow families that are not. And we have to uh, not only breed select bulls to breed for more efficient cattle, we have to capitalize on the cattle that are existing here that are more efficient to uh, to make it better for not only ourselves, but our customers. Mm-hmm. Gentlemen, we're, we're heading into the time of the year. We've already had quite a few uh, bull sales across the country, but we're heading into a pretty busy time of the year where we see a lot of uh, a lot of seed stock being sold out there as folks are kind of getting geared up for what they're going to be putting on their what direction they're going to be heading with their cattle and I guess my thing is just a round table between you two and a discussion between all three of us as we start to head into this area just some things we need to be aware of that we're just not not blindly going into to buying buying bulls I mean I, I realize we all get the catalogs we all go through the numbers but but at the same time what are some things from from the perspective as we head into this year that you feel as you're if you could sit across the table from somebody looking at at buying their next direction the bulls they're going to be going with their herd just some advice you you offer when we look at what we're talking about with this topic on feed efficiency yeah definitely i there's nothing i enjoy more than sitting down with the, with customers before a bull sale um and talking one of the big things we focus on is talking about what are goals that you have for your program you know because everybody's situation is a little bit different um everybody has a little bit different goals of things they're trying to accomplish and i think that's something we have to really look at when when we're going into a bull sale um one of the big things i've talked with guys is is you know what 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 are we looking to to improve on in your area what are we looking to get out of a bull um and justin you know in previous talks we've talked about um you know you you look for for a bull that maybe lowers um some intake and it's going to lower your feed cost on that end of things so that's definitely one angle we look at with that i have other customers too that say hey I'm going to go finish these calves out. I need the bull that can convert the very best possible way he can. Um, you know, because that's a huge end of things too. When guys are finishing cattle, it's easy to look on uh, the day that we sell our cattle our fat cattle and see what we got for them. But many times people aren't calculating what you have in them. And that's a big mm-hmm. part of the bottom line. And we all know if you've ever finished out a group of cattle, that the cost of gain is huge. So how can we improve in that area too? So there's a lot of different areas I think that you can look at and um, different areas that you can look for, for improvement. And you got to sit down and decide, you know, what, what is your goals? Where's your program headed? What do you need that fits best for you? Mm-hmm. Brian, kind of that same question back to you. I mean, if you're if you're sitting down from somebody and, and, and we're headed into this time of the year, your advice. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, uh, Bryson's Dre, you know, every customer, everyone, whether it's myself or Beer Goes or uh, another producer or a commercial commercial breeder, you know, you, you all have we all have our goals, what we want to achieve and what do we want to get better at. And 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 that's kind of the beauty of uh, you know, hundreds of us selling bulls. There's a lot of bulls out there. That are being marketed right now and uh, when we talk about the goals of them you know um whether it's uh you're wanting to 
have more cavities, cattle, you know, more longevity, um, more terminal kind of cattle, maternal kind of cattle. One thing that, uh, you know, the breeder efficiency thing is neat is you can have all that. You can go any direction in that way and still make them efficient. So kind of uh, what's neat to me is you, you can do any of that and still, you know, select on efficient cattle because, uh, you know, 70% of your cost, no matter what angle, what goal you're after, 70% of your total cost on a cow or a calf is feed, you know. So um, when you can narrow down and, and, and try and save money on your, your feed intake and, and your bottom line, you know, you ultimately you can't go any direction. Mm-hmm. I think that's one of the really cool things about it, Brian, that you're bringing up the point there, is that we don't have to sacrifice anything to improve on an efficiency trait. And that's one of the coolest things I think we've seen many other times in the industry. When we start improving one area, we start sacrificing mm-hmm. another. Yeah. And that's the great thing about efficiency is you, you don't have to sacrifice any other trait. There's no reason to, you know, lower outputs or, or go away from Kevinies or go away from grid premiums or anything like that. There's, there's really no sacrifice to, to improving your efficiency of your operation. Mm-hmm. As these guys are, are, are looking at this, sometimes I, I feel like there's there's just so much numbers to go, to sort through when when we go get into the point of buying bulls every spring or every fall, depending on the time frame that the guys are buying buying their bulls. But there's just so much so many numbers, and I realize that numbers have have really been there's been a lot of benefit to the numbers in our industry. But I think at the same time too, there's almost so much out there that pretty soon you're just like I, I don't even know. Yeah, you know, I mean, I, I okay, so I'm going to watch this number, this number, and this number, you know, and that's kind of where I, it's kind of where I'm at in some times. I'm like, well, I'm going to look at these three numbers, you know, and so yeah. where I mean that that in itself has created I I feel some angst in in this whole process of going out and buying bulls. Yeah, I, I think you're right. Um, it's almost a little overwhelming at times, isn't it? Um, you know, I talk to commercial guys that uh, maybe they haven't bought a bull for a year or two, and then they look at you know, look at the, look at the EPDs in comparison to a couple of years ago. And they're, they're a little bit lost at times. And, you know, I think that's something we have to watch as, uh, as, as bull producers. Cause at the end of the day, you know, we can all look at a piece of paper, but we all know there's so much more to being a cattleman than, than a piece of paper. Um, you know, there's the real world aspect to it. How did this kept perform? How did he do? And we can't, we can't ever discount the, the visual appreciation of the cattle. I mean, they have to be sound, functional, um, last, just good cattle. So mm-hmm. I think that's that's something to focus on when, when we've talked to our customers is, yeah, I mean, look at the data, find find a few traits maybe you're looking for here or there that you want to improve. But at the end of the day, find a good sound bull that's going to go out and do you a good job, mm-hmm. you know, so. Absolutely. Yeah, that's, that's a good point, Bryson. I mean, it's the no, I, I love data, and I, and I know Bryson, he loves data as well, as we wouldn't be doing feed efficiency, but, uh, you know, it stems back to the goals of, of whoever you are. You know, pay attention to, to what you need to improve on and uh, what you personally believe in, you know, and uh, I think there's a there is a reason and rhyme for every EPD. Um, there's importance to every one of them, you know. Um, I don't discount one over the other, you know. Um, you have to watch the whole picture, you know, but... Uh, definitely concentrate on what you need to improve on their guidelines their guidelines and and to better us to better everyone Mm -hmm. well let's take a break here when we come back we're going to continue with our guest today bryson birgo out of northwest missouri brian herbelsheimer out of northeast nebraska as we are talking on the subject of feed efficiency in our cattle herds and when we come back we're going to be talking about where they have seen the industry evolve to in the last several years when it comes to feed efficiency in their own operations. But then in addition to that, we're going to be looking uh, and talking with them about our own herds. And do we know what our, where our herds are at in our focus or in our efforts if we truly want to be that efficient cow herd that we all think we have? We're going to talk about it when we come back. If you could do something today that would bring you a profit tomorrow, would you do it? 
In the cattle business, it's about efficiency. And with Limousine Genetics in your herd, your profit is just one calf crop away. With Limousine or Limflex cattle, it's more pounds, naturally, to sell at weaning. It's growth and feed efficiency with the added benefit of carcass merit. The other side of the profit coin with Limousine Genetics is the maternal efficiency, docility, and longevity of your cows and bulls. It's as simple as Limousine Today. Profit tomorrow. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here. And before we jump back into our conversation today on feed efficiency in our cattle herds, you know, something about our ranching industry today, uh, you know, it's just not quite as easy as it used to be to go out and buy land. And I know there's folks out there that are running ranches that you own the land. And there's folks out there that are looking at being able to be in a position or already in a position where you're ranching or you're a ranch manager and you want to maybe expand your knowledge or you want to advance your career. Well, there are those that are out there leading large ranches today, just like many of you, that they know livestock and they know natural resource management. But the exceptional ones are those set apart by their business savvy, their ability to communicate and to lead people. Well, the King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management Master's Degree Program, well, it can give you that leg up to advance your ranching career through their curriculum, their internship management projects, outreach education events. All of these will sharpen your management skills and then expand your professional network. And And if you'd like to share this experience with over 45 alumni across the country that are currently managing over 7 million acres and 155,000 head of cattle, well, I invite you to check out the Ranch Management Master's Degree Program through the King Ranch Institute by typing into your favorite web browser, K-R-I-R-M. That's K-R-I-R-M for King Ranch Institute for Ranch Management. Search that and find out more about their Master's Degree Program. Well, let's turn back now towards our featured interview today on feed efficiency in our cattle herds. I'm joined by Bryson Birgo with Birgo Angus out of Missouri, Brian Herbelsheimer with Herb Angus out of Nebraska. And, and gentlemen, respectively to your own operations, I want to, to visit with you a little bit about where you've started and, and where you're at now and how things, how the industry has changed and evolved over the years. And I know Bryson, you guys have tested bulls for a lot of years. Uh, Brian, you guys uh, not only do some testing as well, but then again, you also feed a lot of cattle out. So I know you have that basis uh, of, of information as well when it comes to this particular subject. But first and foremost, from, from where you started to where you're at now, what's been the driving factors that has shaped the decisions you guys have made in your own operations? Sure. You know, looking back to where we started in the feed efficiency, it all came down to trying to improve our bottom line. And, um, you know, it's something that I don't see us ever going away from because when you look at your cost that you put into the cow herd, it's just so big. And you look at, you know, with the, with inputs, they continue to rise. Uh, we just got to do better. Um, we got to get better. I think that's the one thing in the cattle industry we've been lacking it. I mean, when you look at our other proteins that we compete against, you know, they're kicking our butt in the efficiency realm. Um, you know, with whether you're talking about chicken, pork, um, whatever in, in that, in those industries. So the cattle industry, we got to do better. We got to find a way to improve. Um, we started down that route many years ago and, you know, we definitely wouldn't, wouldn't go any other direction just because I think you can see huge savings associated with it. I think it's something that, um, you know, we, we've, as a whole in the cattle industry, we've missed and area and when you start talking about you know feeding a group of cattle or something the savings are huge i mean um obviously what your feed costs it's going to be a big part of that but i mean it's nothing to finish out a group of calves and to see from the most efficient to the worst efficient i mean we're talking about hundreds of dollars type of ordeal there so and the same thing on the cow herd um when you look at what your maintenance cost is wonder if we can improve that wonder if americans cow herd can improve you know what you can run or how many acres it takes you to run a cow calf pair um what your bottom line can be so we're we're excited about it like i say and it is a complete picture it's not that we want to sacrifice any other trait but it's the great thing about feed efficiency we can improve it while not sacrificing anything else. Mm-hmm. Brian, what about you? You know, looking back to when I started, you know, I've always had a passion for a good looking phenotype type kind of cattle and still do, you know, and, uh, you know, but looking back when I started, you know, it, it don't matter from year to year. Um, you know, we're in, we're in 
northeast Nebraska, and it gets cold here. And um, as we speak, you know, I'm feeding cows right now, and, and you watch your 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 feed supply dwindle fast. You know, um, it just you know cows need X amount just for energy. You know, but if I would go back and want to do anything different, it would have been I'd have been testing my cow years ago, and uh, instead of us running. 200 mama cows here we'd probably be running 400 mama cows here you know there's cows that are are converting and there's cows that aren't you know and it's, it's important and uh, it's been a, a very good learning curve for our operation you know just to find your outliers you know and uh, it's been it's been fun you know it's been it's been learning and uh, yeah if i was to go back and do anything different it would be to be feed efficiency testing from the start you know, gentlemen, one of the things that I think about as we're talking about some of this stuff, and I and I feel, uh, and I and I'm as guilty as the next guy, so I'm not going to sit here and point my fingers like I'm I've got it all figured out. But I think one of the things that comes into some of this kind of stuff and really understanding where our herd is at, as you said, where's my herd at, so that I can go find, uh, the, you know, bulls that that fit where we need to go. But I think the part of that too is I think guys have to be honest with themselves about where their herd is at. You know, when we when we talk about like the subject of longevity, I I don't think people really are honest with the fact that if you really look at your whole herd is the you know the national average is that these cattle are staying in the herd about three and a half years but we always remember that cow that we had till she was 14 or 15 and we think the whole herd is that way right you know yeah and I, i'm thinking there's a part of what we're dealing with here that really as a producer we have to be real with what we've got and it really takes a business and a, and a sharp pencil to see what is our herd doing I think there's no doubt about that. I mean, with improvement in any area, you have to be honest with where you're at. And, um, you know, uh, I think sometimes that's maybe what holds back the American cow herd on the efficiency end is that, you know, as as producers, um, sometimes people are worried to find out where they're at. Mm -hmm. And I think it's kind of been one of the big pushbacks to the improvement in efficiency and so much so you know not not picking out any names but i've talked to a few other producers and they brought that question up to me well, i have this favorite cow wonder if she's not efficient <laughs> well yeah we we need to know i mean we need to know if she is or she isn't and we need to improve on that then because it's just such such a big big area when we start talking about the difference and what what they take you know so i think that's a huge part of it is we we have to be honest where we're at and where we want to go mm-hmm Brian, what about you? Yeah, you know, I can only speak for myself, but, uh, you know, you have to be honest with yourself. You know, when, when you go out and walk through your cow herd, um, you know, there's a reason why that cow that's 10 to 15, 16 years old, there's a reason she's still here. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, and, and you know, nine times out of 10, boiling back when I, you know, just in two years of feed efficiency test, and then cows, they're efficient, and they're passing that on. And, uh, and so, you know, like I said, you know, there is no one cow more important than the next, you know, and because they, they have to ultimately do their job. Mm-hmm. You, you brought up, you know, that cow that lasts a long time in your herd. I think that's one of the cool things, too, that we need to look at with that is that you have this cow that lasts a long time. How many times does her daughter last a long time also? You know, and I think that's definitely something that's heritable. And I think that's the cool thing about the efficiency is, OK, we're seeing a very, very direct correlation with cattle lines. I mean, I think you're starting to see it, Brian. I don't want to speak for you, but I think you're starting to see it. Certain cow families are really getting the job done. Well, same thing with the longevity. I mean, it kind of all goes together. I mean, these cows that get it done, they're efficient, that last, you know, they have daughters that are efficient and last. So we definitely, you know, want to try to, to produce more of them. Mm-hmm. About. Well, let's take a break here. When we come back, we're going to continue. My guests today are Bryson Birgo, Brian Herbelsheimer. We're talking about feed efficiency in our cattle herds. And a moment ago, we were we kind of touched briefly about how all these numbers can start to get a little bit confusing when we're in the process of looking uh, at the next uh, direction that we're wanting to go genetic-wise in our cattle herds. We're going to drill down on that just a little bit as we're going to talk about what are the feed efficiency numbers that we should be looking at in these EPDs so that we can kind of be committed to that goal of striving towards putting genetics back into our cattle herd that are focused on feed efficiency. We'll be back with more on the Working Ranch Radio Show after this. Ka-ching! 
more pounds, more calves, more profit. Studies show Hereford Genetics increased net profit by $51 per cow per year. That's $20,000 in additional revenue for a typical 400 cow outfit. And calves sired by Hereford bulls continue to add value through the chain. A documented $30 per head in feedlot profitability. That's real money and real results. Get more ka Come home to Hereford at Hereford.org. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here with you, and we thank you for joining us here on our program today as we like to meet you where you're at, whether it's in your pickup, in your tractor, whether you're driving somewhere, or whether you're just sitting at home working in the office. Either way, we like to meet you where you're at, and we hope it is subjects that are meeting you where you're at as it is today. We are talking on feed efficiency, and boy, oh boy, I'll tell you, if this is not a subject that can be uh, can fit about every ranching operation out there, I don't know what is. And our guest today is Bryson Birgo with Birgo Angus out of Missouri, Brian Herbelsheimer, Herb Angus out of Nebraska. Uh, we're not really talking uh, breeds of cattle. That's not the point of it. Uh, I'm just saying they're ranch names, and I think that's important to know that we're talking cattle industry issues here on feed efficiency, and it doesn't matter the breed of cattle you're running or the color of the cattle or anything of that nature. It's about the economics of this and, and what you're doing genetic wise to help with those economics from a management standpoint so gentlemen uh, again thanks for joining us on our program let's now get to uh, some of the numbers we talked about that just a moment ago about uh, sometimes we have so many numbers in our EPDs that we can kind of get lost in them but there are some specific numbers and I know probably some of the breeds have some different acronyms for them but nevertheless there are some feed efficiency numbers that we really need to be paying attention to those so let's talk about those just a little bit and, and Brian Bryson, I'll go with you first. Yeah. So some of the numbers that we look at when we start talking about feed efficiency, EPD wise, are the RADG EPD and the dry matter intake EPD. Um, I guess something that we try to do, so the RADG is going to look a lot more at the gainability and conversion rate and everything um, dealt with conversion. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, when there's kind of the two ends of that is what we're eating, what we're gaining, everything like that. Whereas the dry matter intake, DMI EPD is going to look more at just overall intake. It's not going to look um, at, the, you know, the output side as much. And I guess something we're trying to do at Beer Go Angus is we we want cattle that perform. We want cattle that can convert. Um, so we look at RADG and we look at dry matter intake and we also look at weight. So I'm trying to put it together a combination of, of yearling weight, a combination of RADG gainability, and also at the same time, I'm trying to drive down the dry matter intake. Um, you know, and that, that combination all kind of um, depends a little bit on what you're, where you're at and what your goals are again. For us specifically, um, you know, I, I want to see those three things go hand in hand. Um, I want to see cattle that can convert and gain um, and, and push the intake down all the time mm-hmm. that's what we're trying to do mm-hmm. so brian what about you i uh you know same thing you know the numbers what is you're sitting across the table and then and we keep referring to you know the numbers as as we said before there's just so many numbers in these catalogs that we can almost get lost in them but but from your perspective what are the numbers we should be looking at yeah you know and, and i i kind of feel the same way bryson does you know we uh uh, we personally, you know, weight, weight is a huge thing um, uh, for us, you know, at, no matter if you're selling fat cattle, no matter if you're selling feeder cattle, um, weight sells every day of the week, you know, you sell by the pound, you know, so that's huge to us. Now, now if we can get that weight up, but uh, still be good on RADG and DMI, you know, that that's, that's our end goal, you know, and uh, that's what we want to do, you know, and, and along with that, you know, is cattle that are converting well that are doing well are are big rib-eyed cattle you know so it, it kind of to me it's it's correlating itself you know um cattle that are that are that are, that are pressing the scale um and doing it efficiently they've got some meat in them you know along with the ribeye you know we do pay attention to the marbling you know we at the end of the day we do want to sell a product that uh, the consumers want you know and uh, marbling adds flavor mm-hmm. um Know, along with that is tenderness you know so we we kind of you know um, look at the same same things you know weight um what it takes to get that weight and then at the end of the day what what's that muscle what's that meat going to look like and what's it going to taste like on the plate for the consumer mm-hmm. 
So I'm going to kind of push back a little bit here from, from a little bit of that. And I agree. I know what you're saying, Brian and Bryce and both of you, you know, the weight, there's a weight element that we're really looking at. But, you know, I'm, I'm out in the country here where, I mean, we're running, you know, we're needing 35, 40, 45 acres to run a cow. And I'm not really pushing at trying to get the heaviest calf that's sold every year. I just need something that's efficient. I need something that's that's you know a moderate sized cow, moderate to small sized cow that that works for me in these kind of environments. And I realize we got a lot of environments across the country, so I, I realize there's a lot of variability out there. But how do you address this? You know, a guy wanting these moderate to smaller frame cattle and making that concept work. Sure, and I. Again, I think that goes back to, to everybody's goals, um, each individual's goals, how they vary from one to the next. And the cool thing about, you know, feed efficiency testing the bulls is is we have that data at our fingertips. So, um, you know, in your case, Justin, you know, I think you're looking at trying to lower the intake on the cattle, you know, and, um, you know, that's something that we get with the, with the dry matter intake. Um, so, you know, I think as a guy looks at his situation and goes, well, I want to lower the intake, you know, that would probably be something that um, we would look at a little closer for their situation when we're talking to them. But ultimately, even, you know, whether you're wanting more moderate cows, I mean, it, it, at the end of the day, you're trying to put on whatever type and kind that you want, and you're trying to put on as many pounds efficiently yeah. as possible. Yeah. And I, you know, agree. I, yeah. I think everybody's trying to do that at the end of the day. Yep. Um, you know, and I think that's, that goes back to being, you know, a, a good cow man. Mm-hmm. So you take the data that you're given and then you find, you know, the type and kind that's going to work for you and work for your operation. I mean, I think that's something that we can't lose sight of um, anytime on any data that we collect is that at the end of the day, we need, you know, we still need, they got to be good cattle. Yeah. Um, they got to be sound. They got to be functional. They got to have rib. I mean, nobody's ever seen you know, cattle that do very well that can't have some dimension and shape and hold up mm-hmm. so yeah and that's true because i mean once once that calf comes weaned off that cow i want that calf uh whoever i sell it to i want that calf to perform you know and that doesn't matter whether you're raising small moderate or large frame cattle it doesn't matter at the when it, when that calf comes off you want that that little bugger to go well, sure. And, you know, they have to do good for the next guy. I think Brian touched on it before, but you're going to sell that calf. It has to go perform for the next guy down the road, whether it's going to somebody that's going to background it or what a, whether they're going to finish it out. They have to do a good job. Um, you know, and, and at the end of the day, yeah, we have to be producing quality beef, too, because ultimately that's that's what keeps us all in business is that we're producing a product that, you know, the consumer wants to eat. So. Mm-hmm. I don't think we can lose sight of any step of the process along the way. And, you know, as more data is collected along the way, you know, they know more and more about these cattle and, you know, the guy buying them, you know, he's going to know if they do a good job for him and, and uh, come back and buy again. Mm -hmm. Like in any industry, repeat customers, what it's all about. Yeah. Well, let's take a break here. We're going to come back with one more segment with our guest today, Bryson Birgo. Brian Herbelsheimer are joining me. We're talking about feed efficiency in our cattle herd. And when we come back, we're going to talk about feed efficiency testing. Now, this is nothing new necessarily because there's a lot of bull tests across the country that are doing this. But are the results coming out of those tests apples to apples? Well, we're going to talk about that, what that means when we come back here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Animal health is key to your business, so how do you track cattle health treatments? Well, stop relying on pen and paper or complicated programs. Performance Beef helps you record processing data, enter costs, and track animal health history all in real time at the shoot. The mobile app also makes it easy to log pasture and pen treatments on the go. Your health data is integrated with feed and financial information in one easy-to-use platform, accessible from your computer, smartphone, or tablet. Find Performance Beef online to request a demo. And we welcome you back to the Working Ranch Radio Show. Justin Mills here with you as we head into our final segment with our guest today. Now, we still have Don Day coming up uh, in our final segment today. But uh, as we conclude our conversation today with my guest, Bryson Birgo with Birgo Angus out of Northwest Missouri is one of my guests. Also joining me is Brian Herbelsheimer with Herb Angus out of Northeast Nebraska. And gentlemen, uh, we've talked a lot about feed efficiency in this. Uh, specifically, though, 
feed efficiency testing is nothing relatively new to the seed stock industry across our country. It's been going on for quite a few years. There's definitely been some huge advancements in some technology that allows that testing to get uh, get a little bit more accurate numbers with that. But when it comes to the, the data that we're looking at coming out of this uh, across our industry for feed efficiency testing, we really need to know that uh, some of those numbers are not quite apples to apples. And so let's kind of get into that just a bit. Yeah, without a doubt. Um, I think that's something that we have to focus on is that when we're comparing the feed efficiency data, um, we have to look, you know, at, at contemporary groups of cattle that have grown up together their whole life, been compared together their whole life. Because if, if you have, you know, if you have um, a group of cattle and they, they come in from different places and then try to compete against each other, um, you know, there's just some of there's a lot of things that affect efficiency, um, body condition score, something that has had creep feed. If it has not had creep feed, you know, so I think it's very important that we look for, um, places that we can find comparable data. Um, we can find this feed efficiency data and, and look at how they compare it against the animals they've been against their entire life. Mm -hmm. Brian, your response to that same concept of just, just making sure this data is coming from and how it's being put together so that we're, not necessarily everybody's doing it the same way. Absolutely not. You know, and it would be unfair to uh, uh, my bulls if I threw them in with three of those or vice versa. You know, that you just sure. can't do that. Um, there, there's so many things within it. And part of it is, is to be honest with yourself as well. You know, the dry matter of the feed itself um, can affect that as well. So you, you might got to make sure you, you have all your T's crossed and I dotted, you know, and uh, that's the importance of looking at ratios just because Bryson has a bull that did a five to one dry matter intake intake to one pound of gain doesn't mean really a hill of beans if I had the same kind of bull that did a, a five to one you know um it's it's all about the contemporary groups 100 percent. So, it would be no no different than weaning weights or anything else I mean you got to right. compare them against the animals that uh that they were in a group with and you know we all know that weaning weights can be you know changed a lot by by what feed the calves were given so um feed efficiency the same thing is we got to find those large contemporary groups and then find the outliers in those large contemporary groups the ones that were more efficient that's how we start really seeing the change and i think brian brings up a great thing with with the ratios and taking the data then and finding the ones that were good let's improve on on that absolutely because everybody has outliers Everybody has ones that do good. Everybody's got ones that are going to do bad. You know, so you got to identify the outliers and, and build off of that. Mm-hmm. All right, gentlemen. Well, I, I appreciate you taking the time to to look at this. I know it's kind of one of those things you could sit around the table and, and have a lot of different discussions and go different ways. And, and I think there's some some good key points that we can pull out of here to, to the folks can kind of think on as they get through this time of the year. And I'll just go back to each one of you for some final comments. Brian, you first, just some final comments here today. Yeah, you know, uh, feed efficiency is important. You know, and, and I feel if you are a true cattleman uh, and want to raise cattle, no matter what what sector, whatever aspect it is in raising cattle, you have to pay attention to it um, because it will come back and get you. Um, like I said, feed cost is not going down and will not. You know, everything is on the rise, and and you have to find ways to be able to um, stay in the business. And and this is one huge thing that everybody can improve at. Um, and we, we believe a hundred percent. And, and, uh, so at the end of the day, you know, let's, let's keep these cattle where we need them, whether it's longevity or, or let's get them on the rail faster, um, and, and put money in everybody's pocket. Cause that, that's, that's what we're all doing it for, you know, not, you know, besides the relationships you meet and, uh, the good people you meet, it's, it's, we do it for a living, you know, it, it's real world, you know, and we want to, uh, we honestly want to make a living at it and, and feed efficiency can and help you up on the bottom line. You bet. Bryson, I'll go to you for final comments as well. Sure. First, I want to say thank you, Justin, for having us on. Really, really appreciate it. And, um, you know, appreciate getting getting the word out there on that. So as far as feed efficiency goes, um, what I would say to people is it's important. You know, I was in a discussion with a guy a few days ago, and he said, well, that's not how we've done things in the past. And I would say this, we're in a changing market. Um, 
we continue to get more information. We continue to be in a more competitive market all the time. And things got to get better. We got to improve. And even though, you know, we're in a time tested industry that, you know, I'm fortunate that, that I get to farm on a farm that my grandfather started in 1950. And I know there's many guys um, in my same situation. And one of them told me, well, my grandpa never collected that data. And you know what? The truth <laughs> is my grandpa didn't either. But yeah. who's to say he, he wouldn't have if he'd had, had the opportunity to. Yeah. So I would say that, you know, change change is, is sometimes hard and adaptability, um, you know, is, is sometimes different. But I think it's very important that people start looking at this and start start improving their whole process and the efficiency realm of things to improve their bottom line. And I think a good way to start doing that is finding these efficient genetics. So, but again, really appreciate you having us on, Justin. Yeah, thank you very much, Justin. We appreciate it. You bet. Thanks, guys, again for joining us here on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Now, if you'd like to reach out to either one of them, feel free to look them up on the Internet. That's the easiest way to find their contact information, Bryce and Birgo. If you go to their website at birgo.com, that website is B-Y-E-R-G-O.com. Or you can reach out to Brian Herbelsheimer as well at his website at herbcattleco.com. And again, thanks for joining us, guys, on our program. We'll be back with more as Dawn Day steps in to give us a look at our long-term weather when we return on the Working Ranch Radio Show. Do you have a young child, grandchild, niece, or nephew that loves the weather and wants to learn more? Day Weather has produced a children's weather journal full of weather facts, fun weather experiments, coloring pages, and pages to record weather observations for every season of the year. The weather journal is for ages 3 to 7 and designed to be fun and educational. The interactive weather projects are fun for the whole family to take part in. For only $10, the Day Weather Weather Journal is a great gift idea for any occasion. Click on our Amazon link to order at dayweather.com. Welcome back to the Working Ranch Radio Show as we turn now to look at our long-term weather. Meteorologist Don Day joining us. And Don, thanks for joining us here again today on our program. Thanks for having me. Well, I know you've you've been giving us a lot of heads up that we're going to see some major weather weather changes as the as we look into the middle of February. We talked about it a little bit last week as well. You're becoming a little bit more confident of that, and we've seen really up until now some of that colder weather more focused on the East Coast and Midwest. But we could start to see that kind of dipping down now to encompass a little bit more of the western side of the of the country as well. Yeah, what we're going to see is is a transition uh, from the colder, wintry weather that's been mainly in the northern plains, the Great Lakes, the northeast and the mid-Atlantic. Uh, you know, we've heard lots here over the last few weeks about a lot of stormy, wintry weather in the middle to the eastern side of the U.S. They're going to have still through this weekend plenty of winter weather. There's going to be some snow in the northern plains, the Great Lakes, New England, and some pretty cold weather. But once we get into early next week, uh, we're going to see the center part of the nation and the east coast see a high pressure ridge build up giving them some warmer drier conditions and then sneaking in out of the gulf of alaska is going to be an upper trough that's going to slide down the west coast of british columbia now that's been happening recently in the last several weeks but when they go into british columbia what they've been doing is going east southeast more towards the prairie provinces of canada then sliding into the center and eastern areas of the united states basically just bypassing the west coast bypassing the northern and central rockies now we've been clipped in parts of the west with these alberta clippers but now what we're going to see is the systems diving further west into the far west the great basin states and into the central and southern rockies and what that'll do is that'll transition the the more active weather into the west starting next week so that means that the great basin states parts of the central rockies the pacific northwest and maybe to some extent even california is going to start to see better chances for precipitation with that precipitation, how what what's the cold temperatures in comparison to normal? Are we going to see some extreme cold temperatures with that? I wouldn't call it extreme, but there is going to be the door open to Canada, especially the middle of next week. So uh, it's going to be a situation to where uh, temperatures will get cold, not off the charts cold, but there's going to be the potential for a, a midweek winter weather event terms of snow and much colder temperatures and wind for the central uh, and parts of the northern Rockies. And then as that system moves out into the plain states, you know, we could see rain and snow 
uh, even some thunderstorm activity over the southern plains, and we might see some needed precipitation in places like Kansas and Oklahoma, and that could affect the Midwest with some snow, the western parts of the Midwest, later next week. So uh, definitely going to have a lot of weather with it, and most of it will be in the winter variety. Mm -hmm. I know you guys have been keeping a pretty close eye on the developments of of the La Nina or the water temperatures out in the Pacific, uh, and it looks like we're still we're seeing some changes there, but are we, do you have any firmer timeline on when we might see some some of that change that could bring some precipitation later on in, in the year? Well, we're certainly seeing some chinks in the armor of La Nina, and uh, it's, it's in a phase right now where it's slowly starting to weaken. But unfortunately, it, it's going to die a slow death. So uh, we will probably technically be out of a La Nina, probably by April or May. But the overall right, the overall general trend in sea surface temperatures are, are still going to be a bit colder than average in that subtropical Pacific through the early to middle part of spring. So there's there's nothing that's showing an El Nino coming on. But what we do see, Justin, is we don't see the La Nina pattern being nearly as intense as it was a year ago and showing some signs of fading Mm -hmm. this spring and summer with it fading that does bring some hope that this should increase precipitation chances in parts of the west and central areas of the united states it's not gonna be the type of transition to where we just go right back into consistent wet conditions that a lot of folks are hoping for this spring, (laughs) but an improvement, Mm -hmm. an improvement is a way is the best way to describe what we're seeing. And and I think what we've got coming next week is going to be a pattern that's going to go on into March. And here we are talking March. And, and when you, when you get into March and you get into April, one thing you see, and this is true across the the entire United States and, and Canada is you start to see the average precipitation those are the months when average precipitation starts to increase so you 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 normally start to get into a more active pattern as you get into this time of year what you hope for is is getting at least those precipitation amounts that do come to get as close as normal as you possibly can because we haven't been able to do that the last couple of springs in in many areas yeah you bet all right well again don we thank you for joining us here on the working ranch radio show Thanks for having me. And again, that's meteorologist Don Day with a look at our long-term weather. Now, you can find his daily video podcast through his website at dayweather.com or also what I just found out on my own TV. I didn't even know I had this. I had YouTube that you can go to. We just recently upgraded to pretty good high-speed internet, and we haven't had a lot of options until here recently. And uh, I can get YouTube right on my TV. And there it was, day weather the morning uh, weather update from him with complete with video tell you what pretty easy to do you can find his daily video podcast through youtube or his website well a thanks to our sponsors today of the working ranch radio show the american simmental association sim genetics heterosis works which is why with simmental it's more per head period find out more at simmental.org the king ranch institute of ranch management be part of the legacy the king ranch institute for ranch management now open to looking at more more information on that master's program through the King Ranch Institute, go to the, your web browser and type in K-R-I-R-M. That's K-R-I-R-M to find out more about the King Ranch Institute of Ranch Management. Also, a thank you to the American Hereford Association. Come home to Hereford. Find out more at Hereford.org. And the North American Limousine Foundation, limousine cattle deliver to your bottom line. Find out more at www.nalf. Org. Well, the Working Ranch Radio Show is a production of Working Ranch Magazine, branded number one by America's Ranchers. If you'd like to get a hold of me, please feel free to give me a call at 307-363-COWS, or you can send me an email at justin.workingranch at gmail.com. Well, join us right here every Saturday and Sunday at 12 noon Eastern on Rural Radio, Channel 147, Sirius XM, or on your podcast provider. Thanks for joining us. I'm your host, Justin Mills. And until next time, keep your chin down and your mind in the middle. So long. <laughs>